So now I open the correct file. I'm going to rebuild my XPath. So I want to know how many items there were. I'm going to right click here, copy XPath to clipboard. Again, this is using a nice product called Stylus Studio. And then they have this little thing here called the X Query Editor. I can put my XQuery in here and then basically run it from here. And you see right there it only returned one PO item. That's because they put the subscript of one right here. So let's take that subscript off and this one as well and then hit the Execute button again. And now you see there's two PO items. And now I want to count them. So let's put the count function around that, run it again, and it tells me that I have two integers. So now I want to take that and put it back in my XPath inside my Visual Studio project. So back here, I'm going to go here and I'm going to replace this statement right here with the correct XPath. Okay. The next thing we do need to do now is create uh, an expression inside this loop. So we're going to say add expression. And now we need to XPath and pick off the uh, part numbers. So remember we're looping on loop counter. So loop counter should be, actually I think we initialized it to zero, didn't we? So we actually need to initialize loop counter to one. And then by the way, at the end of the loop, we're going to have to bump up the uh, counter. So I like to have that as a separate shape and call it something like over here, counter plus plus. And inside here, we're going to say v loop counter. And unfortunately, you can't just say plus plus. You know, it gives you a syntax error when you do that. So again, this is one of those cases where this talk doesn't act like normal C sharp. So you have to say here, counter equals counter plus one. So in my description, though, I know what counter plus plus means. So at the end of the loop, I'm going to bump up my counter, loop again. It's going to compare loop counter 2 to number of items. If it's less than or equal, it's going to run one more time. Then it'll bump loop counter up to 3. It will loop again. And then 3 will be not less than or equal to number of items, which is 2. And then it will stop looping. So now we need to write our code to go here. Now, off the video, I've added several variables. One's called vxpath, and then I've added uh, the two numbers that we're going to need to check inventory are going to be the product code, which is called here product number, and we need the quantity. So if a guy orders 300 of a specific quantity, we need to check our inventory to see if there's 300 of that item available before we approve his order. So here, what I'm going to do is break my XPath down into a couple of different statements. So I'm going to say here V, uh, I need the part number. So I already got the variable V part number is equal to XPath. I put the name of my message, which is standard PO, comma, and then here's where you'd normally put your XPath, right there. So instead of putting a string here, I'm actually going to build a variable called V XPath. So up here, we're going to say V XPath equals, and then I'm going to put some values here based on what I'm going to build using my friendly Stylus Studio tool. So now if I want to get the product number, I'm going to do here copy XPath to clipboard, and here you can see I can have more than one query, and you can actually clo close these queries. You can hit this button and add a new query. So if I paste that query in, you can see it's, it starts with the root element, it uses the namespaces, it then says go to P items, PO items. There should only be one PO item. And then here's where we actually need a subscript. So this needs to be like the variable X. But right now, just to test it, if I put a 1 there and then I run it, it's going to give me my first part number, which you can see over here is 872AA. If I put a 2 here and I run it, it's going to give me my second part number, which is in the second PO item, which is 926AA. Okay, so now we're going to take this X path and we're going to put it here in Visual Studio right here. And we have to put a quote around it and a semicolon because it's all a big string. Now, if V part number is a string, we need to actually wrap it with the word string. Let's go back to the help for just a minute. You see here, you give it a message 
And if you don't put the word string, it's going to return the entire node. So we need to put string parentheses around our X path and then close parentheses. So string is kind of like its own little function here. Okay. So if I were to run this right now, what would it do? It would give me the part number based on this number right here, which is number 2. Okay, so I don't want this number here, too, to be hard-coded. So well, how can I fix this situation? I want it to be 1 the first time and 2 the second time. And if the loop goes again, I want it to be 3 the third time. So this needs to be a variable. But we're in the middle of a string here, right? So how can I put a variable there? I basically have to split this line here. I'm going to put a plus x plus the rest of the line. And now instead of x, x is actually going to be what? It's going to be my looper. So I have here v loop counter. And I'm going to split that on a couple lines to make it more readable. And I happened to notice when I was over here, there was a little red squiggly under the x. And what it's trying to tell me is, it says you can't concatenate a number into a string. So v loop counter is a number. So what I have to do is wrap it with a converter. So system convert to string v loop counter like that. And now if I scroll back over here, the little squiggly mark went away on the plus side. So we have PO item, open bracket some number such as 1, 2, or 3, close bracket, product number. And that will give us what I'm calling right here the part number. And now we're going to repeat this whole logic a second time. And the only difference now is, a couple differences, instead of product number, we want to get what? The second field that's important to us is called quantity. So I can just simply substitute the word quantity right here. Now, if I misspelled it, of course, I would have a fun time debugging this. And you also want to make sure that the at sign means that quantity is an attribute, not an element. So I want to confirm that by coming over here. And yes, quantity is an attribute that's under an element called PO item. Okay, So here's our PO item element. And then we're going to get the subscript of that, and then the at sign quantity. Okay, and that's going to return us now the quantity, which I think I call V part quantity. And can you guess what else could go wrong here? Well, even though it's returning a, a string, V part quantity is actually an integer. So we're going to have to convert this whole X path back to a number to get it into this variable. So one more time, we're going to convert system.convert to int32. And then wrap it like that. So this is really cool, high-end BizTalk stuff you're learning here. Okay. Now we're going to change this expression to be a name, something like get part number and uh, quantity. Now once we get those numbers, presumably we're going to do something with them. So right here. I might want to call a web service or something, um, call logic, I'll just call it, where we're actually going to go to our inventory system and we're going to see if that data is available. And so we're going to take this one step at a time. Right now, I just want to put a trace here and let's see if we're actually getting the data that we want. And then we'll come back and we'll add some more code. And what we'll do is we'll add a sub orchestration here, but instead of doing a call orchestration, I'll introduce you a new concept called direct binding of how you can call one orchestration from another without some of the pitfalls that you normally have with a sub orchestration. So we'll call this trace 1710. And by the way, it looks like I forgot to put my trace 1700 in here. It's kind of a manual process. We have to do that every time so that we can identify our traces back to actual code here. One other thing I'm going to start doing on my traces is I'm going to add the uh, carriage return at the end here. Oops. 
Okay, so in this tray, 1710, inside the loop, I need to display my part number and my quantity. So part number equals V, v part number. Okay, why am I not getting IntelliSense here? I think I've mentioned this just briefly in a prior video. We're inside an if statement with the curly brace. And so IntelliSense, unfortunately, just doesn't work there. So here, above it, it works fine, but not inside the curly braces, unfortunately. And then the other thing we want to print is the variable called vpart quantity. Okay, now what's going to be wrong with this? V part quantity should be a number. And so right here, the plus sign is going to have that little uh, famous red squiggly mark again. And so we're going to have to convert the number back to a string in order to display it in the trace. Okay, so I think we're pretty much done here. Um, I'm going to go off the video and deploy this and start the test because I think by now you've seen me deploy it a hundred times and you're no longer learning anything new from that. Oh, and I just thought of one more little thing I want to put in here. I actually want to put my loop counter in case I have a bug there. You know, sometimes you get the greater than equal sign wrong. So right here, let's put loop counter equals, and that's going to be a conversion as well. Okay, so we'll have 1710 loop counter part number and quantity and then a new line character. So now I'm going to go deploy this. Okay, I've deployed, checked my ports, I've restarted the host and now I'm going to test. Copy my file. We'll start by, I usually do a hat first just to make sure that we don't have any strange errors going on. So it's uh, 1114 at 124. See the orchestration is started, not completed yet. Oh yeah, I need to be testing probably with my small data. Remember that uh, after we go through the logic, I have to uh, drop the file back in if it needs approval. But that's probably far enough to go look at our trace. So we go to our trace file. This is today's date and time right here. So now remember we numbered our traces, so all I got to do is look for a trace 1700. And right here we have, I don't know why I have TV, but anyway, V number of items is 2. And now here's our 1710 loop. And you see the loop counter is 1, the loop counter is 2. We got our two part numbers, and we got our quantity. And that's pretty good if I say so myself. We didn't have any bugs that time, okay? Let me show you, by the way, of course a lot of people don't have Stylus Studio, which is the tool I use there. Um, building your XPath is a little bit harder if you have if you don't have a tool like this to test it with. Um, but one little hint you can do, like you notice this XPath with BizTalk is much more complicated than normal XPath because of the namespaces. Um, I actually have a blog on that. Let me just show you real quick that blog. I'll probably include this link for you on the uh, menu to this product. And uh, just real quick, let me walk you through this. Here's a normal XPath where you don't have any namespaces. So you can just say, like here, test schema slash A, and you get the value of A. If you want to have a child down here, you can say test schema slash C group slash C child, and you get the value of the first child. Now, what happens when you start putting namespaces in here? Well, you start getting things like no matches, which is not good. So here, how do you change this test schema slash A to get the value of A? Well, the solution is down here, actually a little further. Sorry, getting off track here. Yeah, here it is. When accessing children nodes, the namespace URL can be omitted. Anyway, it's like local name, test schema, and namespace URI equals this, slash, and then local name, parentheses, equal A. 
So this is the kind of what I call nasty XPath. This is nice, easy XPath, which we all learn when we go to a little simple class. But in the real world, the XPath looks more like this. And so in BizTalk, there is a little XPath trick here. If you go to Visual Studio and open your schema, and let's say I want the XPath for the product number, it's actually down here in the properties window. Okay, So you can go to the property window here, scroll down, and then there's a dim or gray field here called instance XPath. And then you can copy that XPath and then go to your orchestration, kind of like what I did earlier, and you can compare that XPath to what we have up above. And you can see it's basically the same. Local name, standard purchase order, and namespace equals, and there's your namespace, and local name equals PO items. So here, you see Silas Studio was smart enough to know that you didn't have to say local name equals PO items because the namespace was blank. So the XPath is slightly different, but either one would actually work. Anyway, it continues all the way down here where product number and local namespace, etc. So you can kind of get the XPath from the uh, schema, but you have no way to easily test it, especially if you want to do things like that count uh, prefix that I, or function that I used a while ago. So we ran this and it worked actually pretty good. So we'll close this video here, and in the next video, we will call another orchestration here to check our inventory.